Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah Ya Rabbana zidna ilma wa taqwa wa barik fi uqatina wa fi aqalina wa fi afa'alina wa la ta'khudna bi dhnubina wa qusurina taqad zalamna anfusana wa na'tarif ala zambina wa la ghafir li dhnub ila ant Sorry, I was a little distracted. Uh, one of the community members was just texting me and asking for a du'a. She's in the hospital with uh, pneumonia. And uh, she's been there for 20 days. So she was just texting me and telling me that she's experiencing pain. She can't continue to speak. <laughs> So may Allah make it easy for her, inshallah. Uh, facilitate her situation and her condition and give her full healing and comfort and strengthen her. I wanted to talk about the whole theme of Eurocentricity and white supremacy and why marrying outside of your group is not sufficient. In the case of dealing with the whole dilemma of addressing white supremacy, and this is something, you know, I've mentioned this throughout the years, because the topic of white supremacy and Eurocentricity is not a theme for me, at least, that is relevant because of the movement of BLM or Black Lives Matter. It's a, a theme that I've been dealing with for a number of years. If not, at least uh, over 30 years, majority of my life from the angle of experience and from the angle of thought and uh, deconstructing the Eurocentric position. Eurocentricity, a lot of people are not privy to it. <clears throat> they hear more of the idea of white supremacy and usually they associate white supremacy with what they see like with the uh, skinhead in the street or uh, the rude and crude violent orientation that's confrontational that manifests itself with racist activities which are associated to white supremacy. Many times people confuse the idea of prejudice with the idea of racism as a system and they're confused with the issue of how that relates to white supremacy. And so this is Part of the dilemma that we have is that the language that's necessary to understand the system as it unfolded, 1492 and beyond, it's a situation in which the lack of language doesn't allow people to identify the fact that people don't have the language at times the terminology to identify certain realities that they experience or they may see or they may have heard of other people experiencing those things. The lack of language is in part what creates the deficiencies that we have in dealing with the phenomena, the reality, the system, the cultural manifestation of white supremacy and Eurocentricity. When you look at, for instance, the apartheid state of South Africa as a model for observation, it existed in a certain historical moment. 
When you look at, for instance, the manifestation of Nazi Germany, it gives you the ability to distance yourself from this society that we live in and to understand some realities that took place in those systems, specific, specifically when we look at the South African example, that will begin to give you insights as to what it is that goes on in this country. And one of the things that people confuse is that they don't realize that the example of the U.S. precedes many of those other examples. They don't realize that the U.S. itself was a prefiguration of the Nazi state. That Hitler admired what took place in the U.S. And perfected that model. And what many people don't realize is that when we look at the Nazi takeover of Europe. That Hitler had dominated most of Europe. And what many people don't realize is that people were not necessarily against the Nazi philosophy, but they were against the Nazi methodology. And so we live a phenomenon in which Western society, and in specific European countries, And in specific, the U.S. along with that. They have practiced a mode of existence which has been built on culturicide and genocide. And culturicide was a term that was actually developed by one of my mentors, Dr. James Fenelon, who was from, who was from the Lakota to describe the destruction of a people's culture and what happens to undermine the existence of a people. But what is taking place can't necessarily legally be described as genocide because genocide is a legal term. And so the example of the indigenous of the U.S. or the Americas in general is enough to have an insight as to how it is that this thing manifests itself. And then, it, you know, because sometimes people are not clear with how this system operates when they look at the case of people of African descent or African Americans. Because they may see someone that is a athlete or someone that is an entertainer outside of the sports industry, or they may see a professional that is materially doing well and they can't get beyond those examples that they see to come to an understanding of why is it that you have a significant portion of that population incarcerated or impoverished and so on and so forth. So they begin to use those examples of material success, what we call tokenism and they use those examples of tokenism to not deal with the reality that you have a good portion or percentage of the population that have been, has been marginalized so when you look at the Afri when you look at the african american example sometimes people are confused because of what they see they don't know how to describe the reality of the situation. So they say, well, it's those people's fault for not applying themselves. And when you look at the Native American example, if you were to eliminate the casino reality, because this is another issue, then you will see the extent at which the people that once were plentiful in this land or in these regions, that how they have been restricted to a certain contained area of existence and their culture has been destroyed so they don't have the means by which to enter into the general society general white society and neither did they have the means to sustain themselves on what is now called reservation as a matter of fact they've been displaced from where they originally were even living and their lifestyle has been destroyed because their culture has been undermined and that's why the term 
cultural side is extremely important because culture provides tools and meanings and experiences that allow us to deal with the reality of life in such a way that we have the ability to maintain and sustain ourselves spiritually, mentally, emotionally, materially. And when those things are undermined, then we don't have the ability to move forward. So what happens when we go back to the, the title of this live, what happens is that people don't have the language to be able to articulate what it is that goes on and neither do they have the understanding or the insight as how this thing works, how it has manifested itself over hundreds of years. And so they talk about realities without insight. They talk about realities without understanding the experience of those who have carried the brunt of the system which has been put in place in practices and in ideas and in institutions and in values and outlook, lifestyle. They don't know what it's like to live on the underside, especially because we have a segment, if we come to the Muslim community, we have a segment of the Muslim community which has been inducted into whiteness. And so that segment of the Muslim community lives in an honorary status of whiteness without taking the full privilege of whiteness. So they've been allowed into certain circles economically and so they themselves have a set of blinders on which doesn't allow them to comprehend and they begin to internalize the ideology of whiteness and support the system without understanding what it is that they're supporting. And then they negate those who are describing the system as it is, as they live it out, as they understand it, generation upon generation, even scientifically, they negate the data because the filter for them is so strong and the commitment to that society is so strong that it's impossible for them to disentangle almost unless there's some work that's done to disrupt that process. And so marrying outside of your community, let's say, give the example that you marry into the black community. It's not enough to say that you have disengaged from white supremacy. When you uphold white supremacy, and here now we talk about white supremacy as the practical ideological arm of Eurocentricity. Eurocentricity is to put Europe at the center of everything as the model of truth. White supremacy is the classification system which manifests itself ideologically in different ways, legally, and in values and practices within institutions and interactions that elevates the color system so that it puts whiteness at the pinnacle of the top. And if you need to have an insight into that, then you go to South Africa, the apartheid system, and see how the system was classified in a tiered system. Where you had, for instance, in one classification or one rendition, you have whites at the top of the tier, then you have Indians, then you have colors, then you have blacks, and then you have subgroups and tribes. But that's the general framework. And that's one of the reasons why I posted the whole concept of apartheid. Because if you don't understand these things, it's not just a matter of not understanding the reality of what's taking place in this society in relation to people of African descent or in relation to people that are indigenous to these lands, but also you won't even understand the Palestinian reality. You won't even understand what is how stuff is emerging there. And we have to understand that even what's going on now in India, people, we have to understand that the Portuguese were in India. And we have to understand that the Indians themselves, when you go back to the Hindu caste system, they were dealing with a phenomena that was like this, but it was supported and it was justified with a different type of religious ideology, but it still was religized, if you can create that term. It was justified by religion. 
in the Hindu caste system. So that people that were classified or categorized as being at the bottom of the class system, that was said to be divinely decreed. Much in the same way that slavery has been justified in this society. And I have to tell you that the Muslims have lost for quite some time now the liberation experience of Islam or even the liberatory or liberation aspects of the Islamic message. That doesn't mean that Islam has lost it, but the Muslims have lost it because the Muslims themselves have allowed certain realities which contradict principles which are very clear in the deen, principles which are very clear in prophetic teaching about how society is to organize itself in its relationship, meaning people, how they should treat each other and deal with each other. It's so bad that today, one today, Paul Mooney, his death, was being acknowledged today. And one of the Muslim brothers came out and said, you know, may he, may, uh, may he basically, it was like the greetings of the hellfire be to him. A complete violation of even Islamic principles, but thinking that you're supporting your, your concept because you can't prove to another person that that person, that person is from your in-group. You see what I'm saying? That that person, you can't prove that that person, is that you, you, basically, you can, nothing is there to justify to you that that person is okay with you. And so, because you find that person to be outside of the Muslim community that you acknowledge, then you automatically cast that person into hell and not only cast that person into hell, celebrate that reality. This is the extent that we have gotten to of de dehumanization. And I had to even send the brother some statements from his own scholars that he follows, that that's not a legit position Islamically. We can't say X, Y, Z people are in the hellfire with certainty unless there's actual textual evidence which names that person. You can only talk in generalities, but you can't specify and say that Paul Mooney is in the hellfire or that Ahmed is in the heaven. There's no evidence to that. The Muslim scholarly orientation when we start talking about knowledge prevents us from going into those types of problems. But that's one level of dehumanization. The other level of dehumanization, it goes back to negating the prophetic imperative or rule or ethic or principle, which talks about humanity. Who's better than who? Or negating the teaching of the Quran that human beings are endowed with dignity. Like al karamna bani adam that we have honored, that we have bestowed dignity on the children of Adam. And here the Quran has no exclusion. This is the dilemma that we have. And so we can have Muslim leaders. And this is my personal problem at times that I have with some of our brothers and sisters that come from European American context, which haven't decolonized themselves and reoriented themselves. Because that's why I call them European Americans. I don't say our white brothers and sisters. Because I don't acknowledge that color system. And if I use that term white, it's specifically being used with a particular intent to address a particular issue. But these are people that are coming from Europe itself as a concept. So we, we have people in our community that they do uphold the concept of white supremacy. Right? And they're still operating within the midst of our culture. Because they themselves operate on that color system of superiority. They haven't negated it. They haven't come openly and negated it and say that, no, we don't agree with this color-based system, which is contrived, which is invented based on the concept of race, which is not Quranic, which is not scientific. It's ideological. And it was ideologically created to justify a race-based system which is organized to oppress one group and to elevate the status of other groups in different levels and put people that fall within the white classification and category at the top. And what we don't understand is that there's certain groups that have made it into that classification of whiteness. And that's why now within this society, there's, there's no problem in justifying what's going on within the Palestinian situation. Because that is part of the brotherhood. 
It's part of the brotherhood. It's part of the racial hierarchy brotherhood. And if you don't believe me in that regard, just listen to what Edward Said says as a Palestinian Christian and listen to what he says about Orientalism and listen to how it is that Arabs have been classified in that part of the world and look at how it is that they're treated in their culture and this and that and see how they fall within that scheme of things. And then look and see now how the Muslims are classified and categorized in India and see the situation that takes place within the, the newfound Hindu nationalism and how it has aligned itself with the white brotherhood and it has been accepted. Don't think that Kamala Harris was some just haphazard issue. No, it was a co-opting, a bringing in of the Indian reality within the system itself. And these are things that are studied, but for some people, they consider this type of stuff conspiracy and this and that because they don't have the social sciences to untangle and detangle or the philosophy that's necessary. So in back of white supremacy, leave white supremacy, leave, leave the, the rude, crude white supremacy of the skinhead outside. We're talking about more sophisticated concepts of white supremacy. In back of that, what gives it energy, what is an engine for it, is Eurocentricity. It is the centering of Europe. And so when we have leadership in the Muslim community, which will center European culture, and at the same time, that don't have a problem with, you know, with bypassing the need to address what takes place within the African-American community and other communities, but specifically the African-American community. Asking the African-American community to take certain positions that will betray his interests in relation to white society. That is an upholding of white supremacy. And I have, I have brothers that haven't understood the sophistication of this and they want to lash out at the nation of Islam, which is a response to that. But they don't want to lash out at the core of the issue. And like I said, if you don't like that response, then go to the core, knock the tree off at its roots and open up to the reality of brotherhood as it should be opened up. I don't have a problem with people celebrating their cultural orientation and so on and so forth. But I have a problem when it means that that celebration is at the expense of the humanity of others. And so when we get into this superiority tier system, if we're not denouncing that, then we're part of the problem. That's why you can have people that are from the very communities that we're talking about. And they could be supporters of the system itself and not even understand. That's why you can have... You can have a black police officer. You can have a Latino police officer. And the way that they deal with blacks and Latinos, it will be the same way that the system is dealing with. And people will say, well, no, it's a black and Latino because the system is already set up that there's already a tiered system of how you deal with this group and how you deal with that group. That's why we say profiling. That's why we say stop and frisk. That's why those policies are in certain areas and they're not in other areas. And so it doesn't, at some point, even matter who you have in that role, the policy itself and the rule for that governs the behavior of that position is already in place. It's already in place. And that's why when you look on the news, if you have a young white person, a young European American or a white person within the system that commits a certain crime, it could be a school shooting or anything. There's a certain protocol for how to deal with that person. And if you have a person identified and classified as black, there's a certain protocol for how to deal with that person. If you have a person that has fits a certain description and may fall into the classification of being an illegal alien, there is a certain protocol for how to deal with that person. And that's what we don't understand. That's why you can have at the border, you can have Latinos at the border and they reinforce and support the system. It's not, I mean, it's not too complicated. When you understand institutions and rules and policies and ideology and how it supports and upholds the concept of white supremacy in a tiered system and how in back of that is saying that Europe is the mother of all civilization. And so if we ever want to get to a point where we have a leadership which is 
capable of addressing the issue. You know, we, we also need a leadership which is capable of speaking to the reality. You can't just uphold aspects of European culture and call us to celebrate and to study European culture. And at the same time, that what comes from the side of your mouth are statements that are anti-black statements and they're registered statements. They're registered statements. They're statements that we have registered and documented over a certain period of time. In other words, how we say in the parlance or the language of the time or the word on the street, we have receipts. So it's not that we're making stuff up and it's not that we have a certain racial card that we're pulling. No, we're pulling the ideological card and saying we need to decolonize. But the Muslims themselves want to uphold a system which is not representative of Islamic values because we're taking benefit from the system. Because people are taking actual benefit from that. So rather than disturb the status quo, people will uphold the status quo, even if the status quo means that is directly injurious, egregious to different groups of people. As long as it doesn't come to our door, many of us are willing to uphold the system as it is. But then when it comes to our door, we want to flip it around and then we want to start bouncing around the real issue and we want to use terms like Islamophobia and this and that so as not to deal with the core issue of racism and white supremacy and Eurocentricity and colonialism, imperialism, colonial, colonialism, neocolonialism. And, and, and that's the dilemma that we have. That we don't want to deal with core issues because of the benefit which we get from the reality. And that's understandable. If people want to take that position for the issue of survival, that's fine. But what becomes the ethical dilemma is when you step into the public arena or the institutional arena, and then you become a mouthpiece for the system itself. And then you become a supporter of the oppression of others. If you're in survival mode, then just stay quiet and do your own thing. But when you come into the public arena and you're supporting concepts which undermine the existence of other people culturally and existentially on a physical, economic, political level, and it causes their oppression and their demise and genocidal tendencies to begin to manifest in their community, you know, that is the dilemma that we face. That's the dilemma that we face. And so this becomes an internal battle in the Muslim community because the leadership doesn't want to take the realms of what leadership does. Even if you were to bring the argument that the uh, textual evidence which documents the relationship of Abu Dhar to Bilal as not being sound, the textual evidence is there, the scenario is there, painting the dynamics of the Sahaba of how they operated and how it was noted to be Jahiliya. In principle, the, the meaning and all of that is all Islamic. Even if you disagree with the uh, sound or the grading, the grading, the, 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 the soundness or the grading of the text, the meaning is still sound. The meaning still upholds the Quran. The meaning still upholds prophetic teaching that we shouldn't be upholding relationship to one another, which are demeaning, dehumanizing based on the color of skin, based on tribal affiliation. The Quran is not saying that you know, and the and the Sunnah is not saying that tribal affiliation, you know, is something that is bad in itself. It's saying that there's certain tribal manifestations which, be, which become a problem. The same thing when it comes to the issue of skin color. You can have your preference, but when you start making that an ideological position to go against other people and demean and belittle and dehumanize the creation of Allah, that's where you have a problem. So if we 